Well, welcome to the Engage 24 podcast and Tim, thank you so much uh, for being willing to come on and speak to us. How are you doing? Hey James, it's a delight to be here. I am doing well. It's a relatively sunny Wednesday morning. All is, all is well. It is sunny actually. And given the weather we have been having, I mean, if you didn't believe in climate change <laughs> up until this month of April, surely you believe in it now, right? Yeah, I mean, we're uh, not now, but when, later on today, I'll be in the wettest bit of certainly England, my patch up in the lakes and, and, and it's very, very, very wet. Uh, having said that, you get the train from Euston up to uh, Cumbria and you notice all the flat bits along the way. Okay. They're all proper soggy. Yeah, I was watching something on BBC News uh, about farmers and you know mm. the number of farmers who they want to get their crops out, they want to get them into the shops, but they just can't because we've just had so yep. much rain. Is that affecting yeah, people yeah. in your constituency? Well, yes, directly and indirectly. I mean, there's, I mean, lambing's been very hard this mm. year. Talking to a friend of mine, they've lost more than they ever have, which is really, really, really sad. Um, but also for crop growing, it's been very, very tough. And also whilst livestock farmers don't grow a crop for humans to eat, they grow yeah. grass. And yeah. if that doesn't grow, they're stuffed when it comes to uh, feeding their animals. Uh, buying in feed from other parts of the country, that's not possible if those other parts of the country haven't been able to grow their crop and therefore not been able to plant the next mm. one. I talked to a farmer friend of mine at church on Sunday and, and a lot of his colleagues are thinking of just... Um, writing this year off and yeah. planting a crop in the summer and hoping for a winter crop. So, yeah, it's tough. It'll have an impact on food prices. It'll have an impact on animal welfare, impact on how much we depend upon imports. It reminds us how much we rely upon those who feed us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Tim, you have been an MP since 2005. Mm. Uh, so here's a big, broad question to, yeah. to kick us off. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what we want to get into. We want to get into what it's like being a Christian member of parliament and thinking ahead to the election as well. And mm. we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But as you reflect back on your time as an MP, how have you found it? To be a Christian, well, it's interesting. So I became a Christian, I would say, when I was 18. There was a particular moment. Um, I lapsed in for, for most of my 20s, I'm afraid. And then in my early 30s, came back to the Lord. And that was just two or three years before I became an MP. And I suppose I had the zeal of the reconvert, um, <laughs> nice. and uh, so to speak. And I, so I was very open about my, my Christianity, about my faith in those early uh, years as a member of parliament. And so, as is known, you know, and, and it felt a relatively straight uh, forward thing, not too difficult. There were moments uh, uh, where there were clashes on particular issues of conscience, but not so many. Um, and then, of course, we get into the period of time with the Liberal Democrats are in government. I'm the party's president, the coalition government with support from the opposition are moving forward with equal marriage and things like that, which cause challenges for Christians. Um, and at that point, I suppose people became aware that I thought things that weren't normal, <laughs> so to speak. Um, even if I didn't want to impose them on other people, I felt, uh, I believe, what the Bible said. Um, and and so it's a matter of record of then I became leader and then it became very hard, really pressured. Uh, but having said that, having gone through that um, process, I often say that, you know, if I look like a rabbit in the headlights when interviewed on matters to do with my Christian faith when I was leader, now that I'm roadkill, it's easy. Um, and it's not, it's not easy, actually, because like everybody else, there's a temptation to be a people pleaser. Um, one tries to choose one's words carefully and all the rest of it and not present the gospel and anything other than, a, you know, a good and truthful uh, light. But for me now, I would call myself an, a post-ambitious politician. I have no desire to be leader or a minister or anything. I love what I do. I think it's a really important calling. I'm determined as long as the good Lord and the electorate want me to do it, to carry on serving the people of Westmoreland. Um, but I'm in a position now where, I, you know, I have an organisation called Faith in Public and we use that basically to use what little profile I've got to share the gospel and to talk about faith and faith in politics. And and so it's been quite the journey. Um, I'm, you know, I regret none of it because even the bits where I've screwed up, the, you know, the Lord has, has used them. So I, I feel... I feel uh, blessed and raring to go for a sixth term if they'll have me. I, I, I so a couple of things I want to pick up on there. One of one of them is this this idea of a post ambitious member of parliament. <laughs> so, are you saying that when you started in two thousand and five, did you have ambitions towards mm. uh, some kind of office if that was possible? Were you disappointed with the coalition, for example, that you, you missed out? Yeah, great question. I think so. When I got elected, you have to cast your mind to the dark and distant past. The Liberal <laughs> Democrats had sixty-two MPs. Yes. Bear in mind, you know, I got elected by 
a mere 267. Um, so it was a, a you know, skin of my teeth election. I was I felt delighted and blessed to be a member of parliament. Mm. I wasn't particularly for it. It wasn't in my mind that I would think about um, high office at all. Um, but I got put into our little shadow cabinet by Nick Clegg towards the end of that um, term. And I suppose you then begin to think either consciously or subconsciously mm. about, well, how far could I go? And then uh, after the 2010 uh, coalition was formed, it was interesting, I was one of those people who one might have expected to have had a second rung ministerial job in the coalition. Yeah. And I missed the cut. I remember the call I got. I remember exactly where I was when I got it. And I remember... Where were you? I, um, I was at the traffic lights at Romney Road near, near Kendall <laughs> okay. College. Okay. Um, and, uh, and all on hands free, James. I'm honestly, got, yeah. 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 Well saved. Um, thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah. And the chief whip <laughs> rang me. Um, and he was a very good friend of mine and still a very good friend of mine. Um, but he, he, he broke the news to me that, sorry, we're not having a minister in DEFRA, so you're not having a gig. Mm. Um, and I remember feeling... Um, a fair bit slighted mm. and a lot more relieved. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I then ended up becoming the party's president, yeah. uh, which is a directly elected role outside of government. So it meant that I was kind of in a protected occupation, a reserved yeah. occupation for the rest of the coalition, yes. yeah. uh, where I was able to kind of uh, be a spokesperson for the party um, during that interesting time. And I count myself a critical friend of the coalition. I'll defend it in many ways, certainly defend its creation. Um, I once gave us... Uh, and got told off by the late, great Paddy Ashdown for saying this, and he was probably right to tell me off because I shouldn't have said it publicly, but I said I'd give the party and coalition eight out of ten for, for policy and two out of ten for politics. Okay. Um, that I think we were massively naive in the way we conducted ourselves whilst earnestly trying to do good yeah. basically through it. So, yeah, um, uh, but so I suppose at the point I became party president, you know, the bookies would have me as favourite for leader yeah. and you get your head turned. And I think there's an element of, so, I, you know, I look at other people I think have handled this better than I did. But I think, so my motivations to stand for leader were partly very good, yeah. partly a, a, an acknowledgement that my skill set was not to be the deputy prime minister of the country, <laughs> certainly not at that point, but it perhaps was to be the leader of a uh, of a beleaguered, <laughs> uh, shellacked party uh, who was building its way back up from the grassroots to to survive. And I thought I did have that skill set um, and thought that was a job I could do. I think I did do. Um, but I also think the level of vanity. Mm. Oh, you want to be, you know, mm. why wouldn't you want to be leader of this thing? Yeah. Um, so, and I think it's, um, so to be, to have got past that is is a wonderful thing. And it's great when I see politicians, and I would always single out Kate Forbes as this, as somebody who was, I mean, she may well have been afraid of defeat, but she didn't act like it. Yeah. Um, and you want to win. It's good to want to win. Um, but make sure you do it on, on your terms as a Christian, which means being faithful. I'm curious as to, so imagine there's there's some young Christians listening to this. Maybe they're even planning to, to, to stand in the future. And one of the things they're wrestling with mm -hmm. is, as a Christian, what's the appropriate right level of ambition to yeah. have as you go into politics? What what advice would you have? I mean, go go for the absolute top if you want, but make sure you are rooted in God's word amongst God's people, and that you're doing it for the right reasons. Are you doing it because you want to have your telly on the face of the telly more uh, or something on your CV, or is it because you want to achieve certain things? Be as ambitious as you as you like. And I think my the key advice I would give any young Christian thinking about politics is, first of all, for anybody in any uh, walk of life as a Christian, remain fully in fellowship mm. um, uh, and and in rooted in God's word and meditating on it regularly every day. But also, I think a key bit of advice I'd give you is make sure there are... Not everybody in your fellowship needs to belong to your party, right? <laughs> Clearly, it would be good if they didn't, actually. But on your journey... Um, you know, maybe you have a, a group of 10 key volunteers in your local constituency or, or your ward or what have you. Make sure a third of them are Christians. Make mm. sure that some people, I'll pick that out of the air, but a reasonable number of them mm. are people who get your faith and are yeah. brothers and sisters in Christ, <clears throat> but also understand the realities of politics. Mm. Um, and therefore, you'll be able to be much more open about the challenges that you face before you face them and as you go through them. And you're much more likely to stay faithful in the process. Yeah. Thinking about your your time then as an MP. So let's say you do get re-elected uh, in the upcoming election, whenever that is held. Come on to that. Um, that will be next 2025, your 20th year as a yeah. member of parliament. Mm -hmm. As you think back over 20 years in parliament, what are some of the encouragements you've had as a member of parliament? 
Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I go into primary schools a lot, mm. and that's where when I get asked, that, that's the place when being asked how long you've been an MP for <laughs> makes you feel almost guilty. I mean, that it's you know, <laughs> twice as long as you've been alive, yeah. mate, is the answer. Um, and that, and I feel properly ancient, uh, and and have to justify myself. So, well, I really still enjoy it, and and, 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 and that, it's true, I do. Um, uh, but I think that um, so the encouragements often, and I'm, I, I also get asked that question: What do you love most about your job? Mm-hmm. And my, my two answers are always going into primary schools because yeah. <laughs> they don't know what they're not meant to ask you. So you get fantastic <laughs> questions with <laughs> them properly left field. Um, and then on top of that, though, I would say it's just the ability to make a difference in people's lives, which sounds you know cheesy, but there's people who've been street homeless who are not homeless. There's people, there's families that are split by what I would say a silly and cruel immigration rules that we've now got united living together under the mm. same roof families brought together um you know children who are on desperately long mental health waiting lists that we've managed to find care for and that mm. kind of stuff so it, it's there are there are big ticket things that i'd stick on my leaflets you know chemotherapy at kendall and engineering campus at um uh, at kendall college all those sort of you know pork barrel if you like the, the hard tangible achievements of things we've managed to get done council houses built all that sort of stuff and that they're really great, mm-hmm. and I'm mm-hmm. delighted to have achieved those things. It's it's the one to one service of people using what influence I've got to help mm-hmm. in a material way people who have no influence. That is what is what motivated me early on as a kind of counsellor in uh, in Lancashire, and what makes me um, want to continue now. It's the ability to be on people's side when they think no one else would be. Mm-hmm. And how, think about those changes you've talked about, the positive things that you've managed to do. I guess the question would be, how do you get those changes done? You know, if someone's listening to this, they're interested in politics, but Westminster can seem mm. a pretty odd place. What, what are some of the things that you do as a member of parliament to affect those, those positive changes? Well, it's all about being very, very, very accessible to your mm. constituents so they feel that they could come to you. Because otherwise, all you get are, you know, uh, clever people um, writing to you about their opinions, and that's great. Mm. I, I would say there's two kinds of casework: mm. there's opinions and there's problems. Okay. I can I can discuss opinions, but I can't yeah. fix them. Yeah, <laughs> I can fix problems. Okay. And I think the and, and the the kind of people who would write to you with their opinions, which I respect, by the way, and and and, and I've often I have changed my views on certain things because people write to me and and email me and come and see me and what have you. I want to be very accessible, so I, and I'm not trying to knock that, but but problems very often from people who don't have a lot of power in society. Mm. Those are the very people who don't come to see their MP unless you make yourself properly accessible. And so my my favourite little example of this is, so a thing I do um, relatively often is we do Tim's kick about surgeries with the kids in Kendall and the estates. Um, and I'm a runner, not a footballer. Uh, I'm not a very fast runner, but anyway. Um, but it's a laugh and we have a good time. And And it's all about, you know, being accessible and being on the estates and being with the kids. Uh, somebody came along, a young woman came along to um, one of those not that long ago. Um, and uh, anyway, as a consequence of being there, um, first name terms, she had me on social media. Uh, I got a, a message from her overnight sometime, um, which was picked up by one of the team in the office first thing. And it's basically her mum, who was an alcoholic, um, uh, it was just the two of them in their uh, flat, they were about to be evicted. Mm. And mum had given up. Mum mm. had totally given up. And the eviction was literally the coming day. And and she just wrote me the message, Tim, and told me her story. And we were able to get involved and fix the problem. And we did, and we fixed it in a lasting way for both in terms of support for mum and stopping the eviction and all those sorts of things. Um, that young woman would never have come forward uh, and asked for help if you didn't, we didn't put ourselves really amongst people um, mm. and make ourselves accessible. So you've got to be amongst people. And then you've also then got to be tenacious on their behalf. Mm. And that sometimes means being prepared to I'll try and be as gracious as possible, but you'll sometimes need to upset the council yeah. uh, or the hospital trust or whoever it might be. But the crucial thing I have to say is a point brilliant staff. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have got fantastically compassionate, mm. um, determined, talented staff who fight people's corner like it's their own. Yeah, amazing. And I mean, that that's so fascinating, isn't it? And a reminder that although you're the member of parliament, that, you know, it is a team sport in that sense, isn't it? That yeah. And I always say that people will often say nice things on the doorstep. And it's my first, and it partly it's just kind of, you know, as a, a 
because I feel awkward, <laughs> I'll say, well, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a team effort. Mm-hmm. But I really mean it. And I mean it because of our local councillors, but I also mean it because of the staff team that I've got. Um, I would feel a little bit guilty that my reputation, such as it is, is built upon other people's work sometimes. But mm-hmm. I would say, well, you know, mm-hmm. I, I kind of give them the, the guidance, so to speak, yeah, yeah, and the permission yeah, yes. to act on my behalf. But yes. they're, they're brilliant people. They're better than I am. I mean, you are the front man of the band. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, yes. That is the unavoidable Not for the thing. first time. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Indeed, yeah. Um, Tim, look, obviously there's an election coming. Um, and uh, it's sort of the worst kept secret that uh, it will be probably, do you think, some point 2024? Yeah, I think there is obviously a possibility of a Christmas election and a, okay. and a January election date. Mm. Uh, I just don't think Rishi Sunak will do that. I can see him going all the way to the second Thursday in December. I really, really can wow. see that, okay. uh, which will be a full five years. Mm. Um, but it feels to me it's either he doesn't do party conferences and it's October or he does and it's November. Yeah. And the odd thing about November is that it will clash with the American election mm. and the British election will have zero impact on the US one. I think the US election could have quite an impact on ours and I'm not quite sure in which direction, but I suspect only the Conservatives can lose, so to speak, from whatever yeah. impact it does have. I think your your average Lib Dem, Labour, Green, SNP, Plaid Cymru voter is definitely anti-Trump. Yes. But half of Tory voters are as well. Yes. And so if Trump is seen to be ascendant, it could actually work um, in a secondary but nevertheless important way mm. to mm. make life even harder for Rishi Sunak. So if I was him, I'd go before. I'd get yeah. it done in October. Okay. Now, you mentioned the American election there. So this is a, a, a very self-indulgent digression. But <laughs> who do you think is going to win in November? Honest opinion, who do you think is going to win the American election? Honestly, it's really hard to call. Mm. Um, and I think just Biden. Um, I on, And I only mm. think that because I think that um, the independent voters in the States have kind of had enough of all the drama. Yes, yes. Um, I think if Biden was 10 years younger, I'd be certain it was him. Yeah. Um, but the thing to remember about Trump's support is it's very, very solid. It's yeah. very solid, and it's not based upon his character. No. So however bad his character is, it doesn't affect those people who vote for him because they're voting for him for because he annoys the people they dislike, yeah. and they're voting for him because of specific things they think he will achieve for for them. Having said that, I think some kind of conviction would make middle America think twice about voting for him. So I, I honestly think I can't call it mm. marginally, I think, Biden. All right. That's the American election. <laughs> sort of that one. I saw that one. We sorted it. What about the UK general election? What do you what do you think is going to happen? Is is it realistic to say that Keir Starmer's Labour Party will get a majority, or do you think more likely a hung parliament? Or will the Tories confound all of the Many, 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 many polls. All these things are possible. Okay. Um, as things stand, you'd imagine a uh, a Labour majority. Yeah. And uh, that's yeah. what it looks like at the moment. Um, and from a Liberal Democrat point of view, and I say to our kind of guys, look, there are there are several dozen seats in uh, in in England and Wales where we are absolutely the main um, challengers to the Conservatives. Um, and well, up to 100, actually, but certainly uh, mm-hmm. dozens. Uh, and we have a great chance of getting increasing our number of MPs there, half a dozen in Scotland, where mm-hmm. the main challenge is the SNP. But I think that a, a really important thing for us, I have to say to my lot, <laughs> you know, and I'm trying to G them up, is look, what's your motivation? It's to mm-hmm. serve your community yeah. and to save your country. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and the latter bit... Um, so what I, what I fear, um, looking into some kind of crystal ball, which I know we don't do as Christians, but, you know, as a kind of a, an assumption of what might happen post-election. So we get a Labour majority. They yeah. have the shortest honeymoon in history. Yeah. Shorter than Liz Truss's premiership. Yeah. You know, because they will have no money. The country's an absolute mess. And they're being very timid. Yeah. Um, so at that point, what does the electorate do? The electorate was fed up with what they had. What they get instead doesn't feel a lot better, um, largely because they can't be. I'm not particularly mm-hmm. criticising Starmer uh, for this. I think he just will be limited in a way that Blair and Brown were not limited in 97 because the economy was not in a terrible state then. Um, and then what? What mm-hmm. does the electorate do? They've just changed mm-hmm. government and this lot aren't, you know, mm-hmm. ripping up any trees. What do we do? And and the answer is maybe look for extreme options. Yeah. Um, and the Conservative Party could very well veer to the right. The Reform Party could grow. Um, forces on the far left might also grow as well. So I kind of think, you know, I say to my lot and I also say to the country, what will Britain and what will Parliament need in those circumstances? Mm-hmm. 
They'll need liberals. Yeah. They'll need people who want um, to make sure a, a Labour government um, is, is, is positive and progressive on issues like climate change and the environment, protects civil liberties, including and especially for those groups that are not popular, mm. um, that make sure we don't go down, forgive me, the Daily Mail route on asylum, that mm. we do mm. remain compassionate, and more generally, that we're evidence-based and long-termist in our approach. So the Labour Party will need a critical, intelligent opposition, as well as what I fear will be lots of kind of populist list trust stuff from the other side, mm. which doesn't really count as an opposition, but it might be a goad to Labour to do the wrong thing. So I think we're really important post-election mm. and we'll only be able to uh, take advantage of that importance if we've won more seats than we currently have. Now, you, you obviously, you talked there about uh, the Liberal Democrats. You're a member of the Liberal Democrat Party. And I guess... It, Here's a question, right? So what is a Liberal Democrat? <laughs> how, would, how would you answer that? Well, so I joined the Liberal Party as we were. I mean, I suppose fundamentally it was a kind of a uh, feeling. I felt they're the party for awkward kids and I'm an awkward kid. <laughs> but I think there's more to it than that. So a, a quick top line, I'd say we're a party that believes in a mixed economy, pragmatic economics, that some things should be in the public sphere um, and we shouldn't have privatised the water industry and the railways, for example, <laughs> but the enterprise is important. Profit is not a bad thing. Business is really, really important. So taking that, that I would hope, um, pragmatic and intelligent uh, approach to how the economy should work, but also recognising that long-termism matters. If we think every individual matters, then you have to think about the people who come after you, which is why looking after the environment is so important. It's why changing the electoral system matters. Every vote happens. The constitution actually gives power to the powerless. It's believing in internationalism, so being a patriot but not a nationalist, mm -hmm. and believing that working across borders is so important. I don't just mean in Europe, but I mean with NATO, the United Nations, and being a force for good across the world. Believing in the rule of law, believing in equality, but that means everybody being of equal dignity. And so I, I, I would say that, you know, having concerns, should we say, about um, uh, the early stages of being human and the latter mm -hmm. stages of being mm -hmm. human are really important. It's about dignity of life. And I think that's consistent with liberalism, even if not everybody in my party would uh, agree with that. So I think it's some it about, it's about um, a, a belief in, in, in uh, standing up for the rights of those. I often say that any old fascist can defend the rights of people who are like them. Mm -hmm. It takes a liberal to stand for the rights of people who are not like them and maybe don't even like them. Yeah, I mean, and you, you've kind of touched on this already, but but from a Christian point of view, where are the kind of the main points of connection? If, if you're a Christian, you're, you're watching this, you're listening to this, what is it about the Liberal Democrat manifesto, the Liberal Democrat sort of ethos and, and values that mm. you think especially connect with the Christian worldview? So I think, first of all, wisdom is a really important thing. Uh, and in the Bible, it is so often a thing that we're urged to pray for. It's one of those things we're told, if we pray for it, we will get it. I, I kind of think, I mean, somebody once said it's the economy is stupid, doesn't they? And the economy <laughs> is so important. Um, and, and so I think we have an approach to the economy, which is seeks to be wise and not locked into human ideologies. I think that's that is a, a a very important kind of part of that. I think what we our approach towards asylum and refugees, uh, a sense that we need to um, uh, love our neighbour in a in a way which costs us sometimes because all genuine love is sacrificial. Thinking about if we love our neighbour, we love those who come after us who we've never met. Um, and that's why the environment matters. And being obedient to God means stewardship of our environment matters. Um, seeking to uh, make sure there are not extremes of wealth and poverty, that is about recognising the dignity of every individual. And seeking to make sure that we protect individuals from abuse and from bullying, these things matter. Of course, the areas where it becomes challenging and where I think liberalism in the West um, some, sometimes needs to have a bit of a, of a, of a reboot is that we will look at, um, we, we will uh, have done tolerance to the extent that we are tolerant of everything except the stuff we don't like, mm. in which case that's not very tolerant. Mm. Um, but I kind of think, you know, in my own party and I think in others in the Western world, I hope as well, we're kind of beginning to see that. Um, and What, make, what uh, makes you see that? What, what gives you reasons for thinking that? Uh, well, so I think there's an awareness. So, for example, I often say um, I mean, the danger with um, the danger with right wing parties is that we get uh, people get desensitized mm. to the value of individual 
individual human beings. Um, and we can end up going down rabbit holes of, uh, of nationalism and of adding things to the gospel, which we're never to, meant to do, um, of guns and flags and all those sort of symbols, which uh, may or may not be good, but they're not, they're not part of the Bible. Um, and, uh, and on the left, the danger is that people get very sniffy about religion altogether. I think it goes along with, I don't want to be triumphalist about this, I think it goes along with the sense that um, in society, a, a, a loss of a reduction in the amount of credibility we now give to the new atheists. Mm. The sense that atheism and the absence of God is not actually the answer to all of our problems. Actually, it creates lots of problems mm. in itself. And that and belief in God is deemed to be more intellectually credible mm. um, than mm. it was. And I think that is beginning to pervade uh, the academy, shall we mm. say, mm. and therefore liberalism. And we maybe maybe see a, a, an interesting example of that just recently with, of course, the great high priest of new atheism, yeah. Richard Dawkins. Yeah. Uh, although I, I would say that this was sort of framed very much in our 24-hour news media as if this was new. But he said that before. He's talked about the fact in his book, God Delusion, he's talked about the fact that he prefers kind of a liberal Christianity, a cultural Christianity to say, to say Islam. But I mean, that's an example of what you were just saying, isn't it? Well, it's very interesting. So I think what Dawkins has said, and then what Tim, uh, Tom Holland has said, are not dissimilar, really, yes. the, the, the Western society societies, to quote somebody else, I remember in a minute who it is, uh, bear the, 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 the crater marks of the gospel. Yeah. Um, and um, so the, why do we think about, why do we believe in equality? Why do we believe everybody's got equal dignity? You know, well, there'll be a debate in the next few days on assisted dying in Parliament. And very often those of us who are sceptical about that, indeed oppose it, are told, well, that's just you imposing your religion on mm. others. But I think that's such a simplistic argument. We have a worldview. Yeah. And those who think it's a good idea have a worldview. Let's test what those worldviews are about. And, uh, and my worldview is based upon a God who made everybody in his own image and therefore we are not just equal, yeah. we are great, lofty significance, yes. immense dignity. And your life, you don't become less dignified and less important um, because you have some life-limiting condition mm. or because you're not able to perform all the functions you used to be able to yes. uh, or because you're flipping miserable. Yeah. And God is yeah. compassionate to you in those yes. circumstances. And if I believe in your equality and your dignity and your God image bearingness, then I want to have compassion um, for you in those circumstances, not just saying, no, no, you can't top yourself, yeah. you know. But we, So we've got to not just do the intellectual bit, but I think Christians can bring to the table, and I think there's a, there's a growing um, uh, thawing, shall we say, uh, within society as a whole to understanding that we're not just following a kind of chief whip in the sky that tells us to do something different to what our, our, our views are. But actually we're doing something that goes with the grain of what it is to be human. Um, and to, if we say, you know, people say they believe in equality and I say, yeah, on what basis do you believe in equality? Mm. Maybe, just maybe, by a biological accident, we can say, well, yeah, we're all equally a bunch of atoms, but there's no moral no. Um, content to that. And if we believe in human rights today, who's to say they're human rights? Mm. There could be human wrongs tomorrow. If there's no, I mean, obviously I believe in the God of the Bible, um, uh, but uh, you know there, ha there has to be something metaphysical, yes. or else human rights are a complete, total invention. And people who die in a ditch for them die in vain. Yeah, they're yeah. not an invention; they're real. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, Christians approaching this election, you know, there'll be some who are eager, excited, ready to go, and then there may be many who just feel a bit cynical. What's your message to them? You know, why why as a Christian should we care about this particular election? So, I mean, the danger for Christians is that we we can panic about the state of the world. Um, uh, we can just think everything's awful. We can think that politics is, to coin a phrase, a mucky business, <laughs> and that why should we want to get our hands dirty on that polluters? Um, and we can also sometimes act as though, and I see this in the states mm -hmm. too much. Um, we see politics as an ultimate thing. Mm. It's not. It's of great importance, mm. but it's not an ultimate thing. Um, so, so don't panic because just remember there is a sovereign God on the throne and all will be well. Mm. All will be well. I don't want to be flippant, but I've read mm. to the end of Revelation. It ends well. It ends well. If we're Spoiler trusting in the Lord, right? it ends well. So don't, don't I mean, I don't want to be blasé about it because what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in Gaza, and what's going on in so many of our communities in the UK, they're tragic, they're heartbreaking, 
And Jesus gives an example um, by how he is compassionate for people in their need. I think about the, the anguish and the grief of Mary and Martha over the death of Lazarus that he joins in with, mm. he completely shares. That is how Jesus is towards the sadness and the brokenness of the world. Uh, he's not going, ah, come on, girls, just... <laughs> I'll raise him in a minute, watch this. He's not, he enters <laughs> yes. in, he's yes. deeply troubled, he weeps, he's grief stricken. And I think that is how, I'm sure that's how Jesus looks at our world today. And we can't raise the dead, no. but we can do good in the places yes. we've been put. And politics is a way of serving people. Um, and so that is why it is good to take part in, uh, in elections, to vote, or even to be an activist in some way. And you know, the thing that makes me tut is always, oh, you're all the same. We're not, we're different. We're, we're all the same in the sense that we're all sinners and we're all imperfect. Don't expect by voting for me or anybody else, you are going to solve all your problems. You are not, but you will be engaging in a process that allows you to be represented by somebody who may have uh, more chance of doing good than somebody else. Mm -hmm. In which case you owe it to yourself and your community to pray about it, to think about it, to know about the issues and then make a judgment. And you know, you make a good judgment or a bad judgment, but it's better than doing nothing at all. And I don't think, I always think the two challenges for Christians when it comes to politics is that we either blend in or we hide away. Mm -hmm. And the temptation for probably the likes of me is that you blend in. And I think mm -hmm. at times I have, you know, you just think, oh, I don't want to upset people. I want to be, I'm a people pleaser. Um, that's a real danger for any of us involved in our culture. Um, and so we mustn't do that. But it's equally bad to hide away. Mm. Um, and I think for many in the church, that's the more uh, powerful temptation. This is a mucky business. I'm keeping out of it. All these people are scumbags. Um, <laughs> and the danger is then you pay limited attention to the news and you're more likely to be susceptible to fake news then. Yeah. I find, I hope this is not going to offend anybody. Well, actually, maybe I should be <laughs> pleased that it offends somebody. I do find, slightly anecdotally, Christians to be more susceptible to bonkers conspiracy theories than the rest of the country. Yeah. And it might be because we think politics is so mucky and terrible, we don't pay any attention to it. And so when we hear some thing on the on social media that makes us cross, we believe it. Yeah, one of the things I love about what you've shared uh, today is just it's just the connection between politics and people. Um, and I, I, I sometimes think that when, when people hear the word politics, when Christians hear the word politics, they think about the drama, they think about the machinations of Westminster and so on. And, they, and you're right, they just think, no, nah, it's all too mucky. But actually, you, you've really landed that point that, that this is about loving our neighbour. This is about serving yeah. people, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's my fundamental motivation, and uh, and it's and it's why I love what I do, and it's it's why you know there are people who have held highish office. I'm not sure if you count being leader of the Liberal Democrats is high office, but you know there are people who've held high office, and when they step back, they often look a bit crestfallen, like they're doing the second best thing now. And I totally don't think that. I'm re I'm really glad I was leader. I'm really glad I'm not leader. Mm. Um, and part of that is about self protection and my own well being, but it's also the fact that I think that. As I said earlier on, I'm kind of roadkill now, and so I'm. It's not that I don't care, but I am. I don't. I feel that I can talk about my faith more openly with less fear, and I just think it's a good use of me. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I'm motivated to remain in Parliament because I love my patch. Uh, and it's getting much bigger <laughs> in the boundary chain, much, much bigger, more lakes, more mountains, more lovely people and more sheep. Uh, and and I'm delighted uh, if they'll have me to represent all of them. But the um, but I, I, and I'm motivated to serve that community. But also, I think me doing what I do um, in the day job, so to speak, as a member of parliament allows me in my spare time, shall we say, to talk about the gospel to people who wouldn't hear it otherwise, to maybe encourage people who are Christians to think about politics in a, a Christian way. But as I say, reach people who may not otherwise um, hear the gospel. I think politics is a mission field. Mm. Um, it's full of people who think they've got all the answers, mm. uh, and I've been one of them. <laughs> and and therefore, it's uh, please forgive me, it's, it's full of disappointed people. <laughs> and they're the ones most likely to hear the gospel. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Something. Tim, there's so much that we could, I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to carry on, but uh, we'll, we'll have to draw stumps here, but thank you so much. And you mentioned Mucky Business. I think it's only fair on this podcast that we give a shout out to your podcast. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Mucky Business, which Premier Christian Radio produce. Uh, yeah. Just give us a very quick 30 second synopsis. Mucky Business, why should people listen? It, well, it's a Mucky Business is a, a weekly podcast so during term time anyway, uh, based on the book of the same name. And every week we look at politics through 
through a Christian lens, the current affairs. We interview a Christian involved in politics. We've had we've had uh, Stephen Timms and Miriam Cates on it, and uh, and various other very famous people as well. Um, so yeah, it's twenty six minutes of your time, and it's well worth it. I completely agree. <laughs> it is really well worth it. Tim Farron, all the very best in the upcoming election, and thank you so much for your time as well. Cheers, James. It's a pleasure. Thank you.